Four weeks ago today, a fire started in Fort McMurray in northern Alberta, Canada. You've heard about it in the news four weeks ago today. Within a few days, 100,000 people had been evacuated from the area. 2,400 structures had been destroyed. And by May 18th, over 1 million acres had been consumed by this fire. To put this into perspective, this is more than 27 times the size of Washington, D.C. The fire is still out of control, out of the news, out of populated areas, but out of control, and it's expected to take months to control and extinguish. We could say that this fire has gone viral. Viral is kind of our word for the next month or so. We are in the midst of a sermon series titled Real Church Going Viral. And two weeks ago on Pentecost Sunday, Pastor Wade preached about that first day of Pentecost. In an upper room in Jerusalem, 120 people heard the sound of a roaring mighty wind and they saw what looked to be flames of fire burning each over each of them who were present in the room. This group of 120 rushed into the busy streets of Jerusalem, praising God in a dozen languages they had never learned. And their words were understood by those in the streets who spoke those various languages. That day, 3,000 people put their trust in Jesus Christ. We could say that that upper room became ground zero for a viral spiritual movement that eventually has reached every part of planet Earth. And still today we hear of outbreaks of flame, if you will, of movements of God, of awakenings, of people coming to Christ, people groups coming to Christ in considerable numbers in various places. And this began on that original day of Pentecost. Then last Sunday, Pastor Dana preached from the last part of Acts chapter 2 about the formation of the early church under the title, What Next?, now for the next two Sundays, I'm preaching from Acts chapters 3 and 4, and we continue to look at the story of the early church. Here in the scripture that Kevin has read for us, God used Peter and John to heal a lame man who was begging by the beautiful gate of the temple there in Jerusalem. First this morning, we want to look at Peter and John as Christians whose actions we might want to imitate or follow. And then secondly... We want to look at the lame man's actions as a template for us as we strive to fulfill our God-given potential. I'd like for you to turn, please, to page 8 in your bulletin as we look together at this outline. And as we read together, under the first heading, Peter and John, please read with me the three points. They were going to a prayer meeting. Two, they made a connection with the lame man. Three, they gave him what had to the lame man. And under the lame man, as a template for us in fulfilling our God-given potential, one, ask for help. Two, expect that God will meet your need. And three, get up and move when God tells you to. I particularly like that last one. Let's look for a few moments at the behavior of Peter and John as a guide to our own behavior. If we want to be used of God, this is a good place to begin. Peter and John could hardly get better than that for examples to follow unless it was Jesus himself. Notice, number one, that they were going to a prayer meeting. Verse 1 tells us, Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the 3 o'clock prayer service. When we think of Christians who are fully alive to God's grace we will often find that they meet together with other Christians purposefully to pray together. The early church met together, and Luke recorded it in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 4, Acts chapters 12 and 13. We can imagine and believe that this was the regular practice on many other occasions that Luke did not record. And viral Christian movements throughout the last 2,000 years have been characterized often by corporate prayer, people coming purposely together to pray. For example, 
in the nation of Korea. In 1900, only 1% of the population of South Korea were Christians. Since that time, the Church of Jesus Christ in South Korea has doubled about every 10 years. There's a record of a great movement of God in Korea in 1907, and those who were there and observed it said that it reminded them of the extraordinary manifestations of power that that were there with the revivals under John Wesley. Not John Wesley wasn't in Korea, but you understand what I'm saying. There was a move of God that reminded them of what was taking place in England under Wesley's ministry. And that great movement of God in 1907 was a critical time. Within the five years of 1903 to 1908, the Church of God in Korea quadrupled in size in five years. A common feature then and now for the Korean church is that they meet together to pray regularly. We have Korean Christian friends just up the road here on Yellow Springs Road. And if you go there at 4 a.m. past the road or 5 a.m. or 6 a.m., very often you'll see cars parked there. And it's their habit, as it is with Koreans in many parts of the world, to meet in the early hours of the day and to pray often also to have weekend or week-long retreats. Now here at Brook Hill, God has blessed us in many ways. But getting together for corporate prayer doesn't seem to have been a widespread activity among us, at least not during my years here. This week I was thinking how it was two years ago before Brook Hills Downtown Christian Fellowship began meeting on Saturday mornings. Rich Shutter Sr. and I made a decision that we would go downtown on Tuesdays. And at the beginning, we prayer walked. Then Rich had a little difficulty walking, and so we went to the Frederick Coffee Company to pray or to the Rescue Mission to pray. And we were asking God, God, what would you have us to do here? And then as the Lord began to assemble a core team, we continued to meet on Tuesday mornings right up to the present time. We meet weekly, and the main feature of our gathering is praying together around a circle, giving each person an opportunity to pray. I attribute much of the success that is going on down there to those weekly circles of prayer. Yesterday, there were 41 people present there at the Blue Side Tavern. The room is full. What do we do now? Well, beginning on June 10th, on Friday mornings, we'll begin a second downtown worship gathering each week. You can't let the shoe determine the size of the foot. And so that's our next step. Be praying for us. We really don't know what God has in mind, but we, we want to be listening to Him. And a big part of that listening is involved in this practice of corporate prayer. Why does corporate prayer work? Some would say it is the placebo effect. It works because we think it works. Others would say that it helps to build team spirit and unity around a common goal, and no doubt that's true. I believe that when we pray together corporately, there is a greater intensity to our prayers than when we pray by ourselves. I believe that supernatural forces are unleashed to help us. Certainly they're unleashed when we pray individually, but Neil Arsenault in the last service said the whole universe is built on something. What was it? It was the power of squares, the law of squares. That if one person gets to pray, that's one person's power. If two people get together to pray, that's four people's power. If four people get together to pray, that's 16 people's power. I don't know if that's true or not, but I do know that there is an intensity and a result that seems to come from corporate prayer that is a greater, that is greater, it's more than just one plus one equals two. One plus one seems to equal something greater than two. So first, Peter and John were going to a prayer meeting. Then secondly, notice this, they made a connection with the lame man and since this outline had to go to print long before my sermon was completed, 
This is a little bit too vague to say that they made a connection with the lame man. Really, they listened for God's voice and obeyed him boldly. Notice what it says in verses 4 and 5. Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, Look at us. The lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money. Now, I'm not wanting to make too much of this, but it seems that there was a meeting of the eyes. The scripture says Peter and John looked at him intently, and the lame man looked at them eagerly. I can imagine that in that moment of eye contact, the lame man might have been thinking, okay, what? What's next? And I can imagine Peter silently saying, also, Lord, what's next? If it was you, wouldn't you be saying something like that? What's next? I believe that Peter was listening at that moment to the voice of the Spirit. What do I do now, Lord? What do I say next? This kind of behavior on Peter's part, this living in the moment and listening for the immediate voice of God, this was common among the early disciples of Jesus. They had no doubt seen Jesus functioning in that same way. Jesus said that I do nothing except what my Father tells me to do. And we can imagine that Jesus in his own ministry was communing many times throughout the day and speaking to the Father and saying, Father, what next? And there was this obedience and submission to the Father as he was going healing and teaching and all of the things that he was doing. Those days for Peter seemed to be days when he was in sync with the Spirit, in step with the Spirit, and the result in this case was a miraculous sign, a great healing of a man who was apparently born lame. What was Peter doing? He was pausing. He was listening to the voice of God. And then he was obeying God with boldness and faith. Can I just say that my nature is not to be in the moment? Maybe you're like me. I want to make a plan for the day. I've got a schedule to keep. I've got a number of things to be done. And I want to do it. I want to do, complete all of those things in the day. But it seems to be that very often the way that God works is not specifically in that way. And so I've begun to pray, okay, God, interrupt my schedule with your schedule today. And boy, does he do it sometimes. In an aggravating way, sometimes. <laughs> But I'm praying, God, help me to see the people who are around me. Help me to understand the situations that are around me. Give me ears to hear your voice. Is there somebody that I can encourage? Is there someone who I can assist in some way? Is there some phone call I need to make or something that I need to do? Help me to live in the moment. And this should be, I believe, a prayer for each of us if we're walking in step with the Spirit of God to let his plans become our plans. So they were listening for the voice of God and obeying Him boldly. Then third, Peter and John gave what they had to the lame man. Verse 6, But Peter said, I don't have any silver and gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, get up and walk. Now Peter and John had no money for motel stays. I have money for motel stays, and I'd rather have something I could give people than a motel tell stay. Can I just say that? They had no money for a meal or a wheelchair. But this is what they had. They had confidence in the name of Jesus Christ. Do you believe today that there is power in that name? That the name of Jesus, used under the authority of a person who is in submission to the will of God, under the authority of the name of Jesus, I believe that demons tremble. If you don't believe in demons, I don't know how to talk about that, but even then, to use the name of Jesus, something powerful happens. Next Sunday, I hope to focus a big part of the message on that, on the power of Jesus' name. 
as we look at what happens next, because this got Peter and John into all kinds of trouble, and we want to look at that next week. So let's look quickly then beyond to the lame man and to his actions as a model, a template for us to fulfill our God-given potential. First, we must ask for help. Verse 3 says he asked them for some money. Asking. Men, we have difficulty in asking. Have you gotten yourself into trouble sometime for not asking someone for help? I got in a real mess a month ago. There was the War Room movie was to be scheduled that evening. I thought I had the audio-visual all together. There on Saturday afternoon, I worked for three hours trying to get something straightened out. You know, I could have called Tom... Could have called Jeff. I ended up calling them both, but I could have called them a lot earlier and saved myself a lot of frustration, a lot of aggravation. Can I just say, if you think that your potential is fulfilled without the help of other people, your vision is too small. God's potential for you will not be used up by you sitting in a room by yourself. You need to expand and enlarge that vision of what your potential is because almost certainly it involves other people. People that you will ask for help. Your team. And this speaks to us of the beauty and the value of Christian community. This is a time of grief and loss for our congregation. I was so delighted yesterday to see Steve, Lisa's husband, come to the Dunkin' Donuts men's group, as he often does, and to be there, and his state, he said, I'm here because I need you guys. I need to be around you. There is strength in numbers. There's beauty in the Christian community as we find solace in times of grief, in times of loss. So we need to ask for help. Number two, we should expect that God will meet our need. Number five, Verse 5, the lame man looked at them eagerly expecting some money. That's what a beggar would expect, money. He didn't realize that God had a bigger plan for him and for his expectations that day. Expectation is a kind of faith. We can call it risk, if you like. God wants to put us fairly often into places where we've stepped beyond our comfort zone. When we're out there and then... The only person who can come to our assistance is the Lord. We need to move out of our boats often under the crashing waves where Jesus is and he's reaching out his hand to us and he's saying, come. We need to expect that God will meet our need. And then moving quickly now to number three, get up and move when God tells you to. Does anybody need to get up right now? You can get up if you want to. Don't leave. <laughs> Verse 7 and 8, Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. Then walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. Friends, we need to get up and move when God tells us to move. If you want to fulfill your God-given potential, there will be a time for action. We will have to do something. If you're going to walk on the water, you've got to get out of the boat. How many men here have ever courted a woman to be your lawfully wedded wife? Mm -hmm. Do you remember those days? I'm wondering if it was enough just to say, okay, well, I've got three hours this afternoon. I'm going to sit on this park bench, and maybe the right woman will come along. Anyone tried that? <laughs> Don't respond. <laughs> Isn't there a need for us to keep our eyes open, to be actively seeking that person? I read this to my wife last night. She said, were, you, were your eyes open? Were you looking for me? And I said, yes, I was. Yes, I was. It will help if we pray, and when we finally then meet that right person or see them, 
We'll need to introduce ourselves. Don't come up with any pickup lines. Just say hello. <laughs> and then there's the act of getting to know her, interacting with her in a hundred different situations. But you'll have to do something. I know a man who wanted to get rich. He's a relative of mine. He was not really college material, but he did take a course for several months on the basics of finance. He cultivated relationships with men who were wealthy. I'll give him this. He was a hard worker. He probably had 10 jobs before he found the one job that made him a millionaire several times over. But he had to do something to get rich. What needs to happen in your life for your God-given potential to be fulfilled? Don't get me wrong, there's a time to sit and wait. But when the time comes to move, it's time critical. It's time sensitive. Then you need to get up and move. I'm wondering today if God is not speaking to some of us here about some particular thing for which we need to get up and do something. Is it time to find some Christian friends and begin to meet together for prayer? Time to start living in the moment and listening for the voice of God rather than rushing through our day. Time to give what we have to the person in need who's right there in front of us. Perhaps it's time to ask for help. You've been beating your head against the wall and you need, some, you need to ask somebody for some help. Time to exercise faith and boldness and to take a step in a new direction. Maybe today is the time for some of us to get up and move toward the future God has for us. That's what I want to do. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the power of your word. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for your spirit here in this place this morning. We've asked and we continue to ask that you would take your word and apply it to our lives in a way that is suitable and just right for us. Give us ears to hear and give us the determination to get up and move when you tell us to. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.